So my colleagues from IFM Software, Marcel Müller and Matthias Meyer, Bayer, sorry, I always do that wrong, would like to present to you today an interesting and promising proposal of an architecture innovation of, for the Ledger IO. Um, they already implemented that new approach in a prototypical way uh, to evaluate it and validate it. And today they want to present the core idea and the experiences they made along, the, along a concrete example of connecting um, a commercial IFM product, software product, it's IFM Moneo, it's an IoT software suite to acquire data, pre-process it and uh, pass it over to other target systems. Um, and they want to um, uh, connect this uh, with Microsoft Azure IoT Hub using the NetGIO. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm really curious. And Marcel, over to you. Just switch over to the right slide deck. And here we go. Thank you. All right. Hi, I'm Marcel. And I'm Matthias. <laughs> All right. And I will, I will start with the presentation with um, a quick overview of um, one of the goals I would say that went into it and also um, how we kind of got there. So at the beginning, um, we saw a nice overview of what we wanted to achieve, right? And for us at AFM, it's important that we might find a way where we have our sensors on one side with the data and everything and to get it someplace in the in this case, uh, we chose the cloud, for example, and have a easy way to do it. And Finedge um, solves this, of course. And we had some uh, when we then joined the project, we had some. Uh, we looked. We looked at how everything works and how the whole project was uh, organized, and um, we worked together um, with the team to also answer some of our questions. Since um, well. Everyone, I would say, in this sphere has different uh, demands, different kind of, um, I would say, requirements on the project. And we wanted to see how we can kind of like make sure that everyone is satisfied with the end product and is able to actually uh, use it. Um, and for this, we thought about how um, things could, for example, look like for Finesh. So we proposed uh, an architecture which might Recognize already it's it's quite similar. You have different paths that uh, talk to each other, and so the, the image might be a bit crowded, but it's 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 fairly simple. And uh, I would say what you already seen before, where you have um, some data source. In this case, I have a Moneo talking uh, to an MQTT broker, and we kind of want to get that data from that MQTT broker to Azure. And how do we do this? And well. We do it the I would say similarly to the previous way, but this time we uh, have chosen what happens actually if instead of I would say having a loosely kind of uh, type message where it's just a bag of bytes with an MTT message, we kind of like enforce some kind of order into the whole graph of different parts that speak together. And what can you do with that? Like, um, and what happens when you do it? And so what you can see here is that similar to before, you have some component of Finnage that speaks MQTT, receives the incoming MQTT message. You have a mapper that transforms that MQTT message into a measurement, and that then gets sent to where you want it to. So in this case, the Azure Bridge. And the Azure Bridge itself knows how to handle measurements, so it will easily accept it. But since it can handle measurements, they can come from anywhere. So, for example, CPU statistics, if you want to know how the device is doing, um, you will be able to receive that through the same kind of channel where you just simply plug it in and say, please, CPU plugin, send it also to the Azure Bridge. And the same way, of course, you still have this outside connectivity to extend it as, as, as far as you wish, where, for example, through uh, your Python scripts, you will be able to do the exact same thing where you can send, uh, for example, in this case, events to Azure, which is something that it also accepts. And uh, we kind of built this whole model where instead of having, I would say, this microservice oriented architecture, you just have a single executable, which for our use case makes it easier, for example, um, to deploy it and also have some more assurances about its runtime and how to update it, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, well, the end result is it, it does work. We get messages to the cloud and are able to uh, yeah, route it through this, I would say, garden of plugins inside of Finnage. Um, so to explain to you how this kind of works and how we believe the whole thing um, can be done, 
we split it up into two parts. The first part is going to be from an end user perspective where no code is going to be involved, just simple configuration. And there's going to be a second part from a developer perspective where there will be some code involved. Uh, but I think that's natural as a bit of developer. Um, so starting from the user perspective. So obviously there are some steps that are needed that are outside of Finedge, so to speak. So you need a Monero installation, you need to configure Monero, you have some MPTT broker outside, and you need to have an Azure IoT hub that is able to receive messages. And then we can focus on the part, I would say, that is like this project, which is how to would how would you configure this Finedge um, instance that you have. So let's dive right into it. So you would have a single configuration file in which you kind of define the graph of plugins that kind of exist, right? So you always you always have this graph. It's usually implicit, but we chose to make it explicit. You exactly say from where to where does information flow so that you have complete control over it, are able to log it implicitly, are able to transform it as you wish. And to do this, we kind of thought, OK, well, what does there exist? How does it work? How could you do this, right? So you, so we chose that there's a concept called plugin kind, right? So it's, for example, an MQTT, right? So you can have a plugin kind of MQTT that listens somewhere for MQTT messages and sends them further along for processing. And this needs to be configured. So the configuration file is born. And in there, you can see quite naturally that, well, we have an MQTT host that uh, listens on uh, that exposes the port on localhost 1883 and we want to send all the messages that we receive on it to our target plugin which in this case we call Moneo and Moneo well it's configured in the same way in that you say okay well it's a kind Moneo mapper so you could have multiple if you wanted to if you had multiple data sources for example um, so not just Moneo but another kind of mapper um, and this mapper needs to know, well, where does do you send that data? And in this case, we send it to a plugin called AG, AZ, short for Azure, uh, which we define subsequently as the type Azure Bridge. And it is configured with all the data that you need to, um, to authenticate to the bridge. Um, and you then, when you then actually start up Finedge, you get all the nice lookout, but you can see what actually happens inside. So at the top, you can see what kind of plugins exist. So we already wrote quite a few. There's, a, for example, an average plugin, a sysinformation plugin, which we talked about earlier with the CPU stuff. Um, and then you can see that only the plugins that we configured start up, right? The others do not start and are not touched at all since we day weren't asked for. And after that, you can see some log output of actually receiving a message over MQTT, it being sent around inside this FinEdge IO configured instance before the last plugin in the in that chain, which is the Azure Bridge, sends a, a, just an info output of, well, we actually sent it. And then it's on Azure's side to handle it. So what are the key takeaways of this, I would say, proposal that we have is that misconfiguration of any part causes FinEdge to emit an error and exit directly, giving the user direct feedback, which is in our eyes very important because you do not wish to have data, for example, lost because you mistyped some MQTT topic. And the same way, we also want to make sure that if it worked once, it will continue working in the future, which is that we find that configuration needs to be reproducible. There shouldn't be any runtime tinkering during um, that are that is major in any way that uh, would change, I would say, the properties of the different parts. Um, and then there comes some, I would say, very nice properties is that the messages are typed, which means that you can ensure that plugins have a common interface they can rely on, and well, the data flow is dictated by the user. So for example, how this could look like, there's an unknown plugin kind, MTT, well, it's because you mistyped it, that's called MQTT, right? And then it just doesn't stop. Or for example, you try to send measurements, to a plugin that is unable to handle them, which in this case is a filter plugin. And um, you also get an error because, well, what should it even do with that? That's obviously a user error. So it tells you that. And how does we how does a plugin of achieve all these things? Well, that's what Matthias is gonna tell us now. Hi. <clears throat> Hi. So I'm gonna take you through how a developer would uh, implement uh, this data mapping from your data source to Azure. First of all, 
In this scenario, we are implementing the plugin in Rust. Other uh, programming languages will, of course, be possible, but due to the nature of this, uh, it's just an example. We are talking about Rust in this case. So, um, first of all, of course, you need to set up a new Rust project and you're not, uh, a new Rust crate where you implement your code. This is where your use cases are implemented. Then you need to implement a required and required API, which uh, consists of two parts. Um, first of all, you need to have a plugin builder that is able to instantiate your plugin. And the second part is you need to implement, of course, your plugin and you need to declare it, which is where your um, custom, uh, where your domain specific um, knowledge goes. Then you need to register your plugin builder within ThinEdge.io, which is um, you need to make it available to ThinEdge. So ThinEdge is able to start it and um, process its, uh, its life cycle. So in this case, we are going to send random measurements. It's just an example. We send random measurements uh, to some plugin in the, within the ecosystem at a configurable uh, interval. So for example, every second we send just the float value to some other plugin in, within the ecosystem. Um, as you can see on the right side, we need to have an address which, um, which is um, your external interface, something you talk to and send measurements in this case to, and you need to, be, uh, you need to declare what your plugin can receive. In this case, we cannot receive anything. It's just an example I said. Next, um, you need to uh, implement the plugin interface, and the plugin interface consists of two parts. The first part is you need to somehow start your plugin, um, which is the main entry point of your plugin. So this is basically like a main function. In this case, we are just um, starting a main loop, which ticks every um, configurable uh, amount of milliseconds and um, just start this main loop. And then uh, the plugin is basically started. Um, in the lower section, you can see the main function, which um, generates a random value and packs it into a measurement object and then sends this uh, measurement object to another plugin. So, of course, you want to give your users the possibility to configure this um, this this plugin that you just wrote. So, um, in this case, we are defining a um, configuration object where the user is able to set uh, the interval that uh, the random numbers should be created. And uh, a target. This target is the other plugin you your your user wants to talk to with with this random uh, measurements. And then we need to make a, a function available to ThinEdge that is able to instantiate your plugin. Like right, you first inst instantiate your plugin, then you start your plugin, and uh, ThinEdge takes care of the whole life cycle. So in this case, we are uh, seeing the instantiate function in the lower section. And what this does is it uh, fetches the configuration for your specific plugin, then fetches the address of uh, the plugin you want to talk to, and then uh, emits the, the plugin instance. So um, what are the key takeaways here? Um, the plugins in this case was implemented, the plugin in this case was implemented in Rust. But other um, programming languages would, of course, be possible, but would have to implement basically the same concepts as we just saw. Um, everyone is, uh, has to declare their plugins through an API, so ThinEdge can uh, ensure that the compatibility between plugins um, um, to be able to like compose the application out of them. Um, end users are assured that the plugins are compatible with each other in the ecosystem. Um, and um, because you stay, um, you implement a common API, end users are now able to compose um, which plugin talks to which. Okay, thank you. Um, this was how to write your own plugin. And uh, we are now open to questions. Okay, so thank you, Matthias. Thank you, Marcel for um, yeah, the interesting insights um, of this um, uh, yeah, kind of innovative approach that 
to some extent differs from the way we work and we in, in incorporate the, the different plugins today. But um, yeah, this is uh, really something we want to get feedback on. Uh, we already discussing that in the community um, uh, quite intensively, and, and uh, we really want to yeah um, open up our rationals here um, and, and discuss it with you. So, um, if, uh, are there any questions from from the audience uh, from your side? Let's see if something happens in the chat. Ah, there's 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 the hands coming. There's the hand coming up. So Mario Heidenreich has a question. So I unmute your mic now. Oh. Okay. okay. Ah. Can you hear me? Go. Go okay. ahead. Uh, thanks for the presentation first. Uh, I, I really like the approach that you take with the plugins in general. Uh, makes it much more modular. Um, so one thing I quite didn't understand is that you were talking about communication between the plugins. Is this going to be still over the MQTT broker or is this like in? Um, so I me back again. Um, so in this case, we chose that the direct the communication between the plugins, if you choose to, is between um, is in process, which has the advantage that well, you don't need to serialize and deserialize every time. It's just a, I would say just a pointer, so to speak, that gets sent around. Um, but at the end, it's just code, so you can choose to also use different methods if that's what you wish. Okay, so. Is it like then a point to point communication or can you kind of have multiple plugins listen to this output of a single plugin, et cetera? So do you keep the flexibility that like you have with the typical pub sub mechanism that you have on a broker? Um, so you can definitely send messages to multiple plugins at the same time, um, which would in this case be in your configuration, just an array. Of, uh, of target plugins that you wish to send things to. So I think that the answer would be yes to your question. Okay, great. And uh, you said you have to configure this pipeline and then you kind of make sure that plugins are started in a correct order. So you kind of have a dependency management there. Mm, so, uh, so there is no direct dependency management at startup. The thing that is, um, I would say, checked is that the plugins, so that the plugins talk to each other, um, have, I would say, the ability to support the messages that are going to be sent later on. To see what, where, where that goes. So it's not dependency itself, but uh, yeah, the ability to, like kind of like a type check, so to speak, in other languages. But for finish. All right. Okay. Okay, and that will be tested during startup. So, exactly. like, okay. Because I, I, I mean, what we probably don't want is to have like this kind of dependency hull where you need a plugin to work for other plugins, and if you have different versions or cyclic uh, dependencies, then everything breaks down. Exactly. No, um, that is in my, so it's like it's just a prototype, of course. So I can't speak for the future. But I don't think that any kind of dependency is required since the whole idea is that for the whole thing to be asynchronous. So um, if there is any kind of dependency between, uh, I would say, plugins that can be solved, solved in another way than uh, at startup. Okay, thanks. All right. 